I think Professor Gadam Pale hasn't joined me. I'm just going to give him a call. Okay. Uh, he's around too. As he's using my link. Okay. Uh, Professor Gadam Pale, are you are you online? You need to unmute yourself, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. Okay. okay right. Uh, let me go through this. Uh, just a moment. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Can you hear me, Shamun? Shall we start? Yes, sir. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, how much audience is there? 16 people are joining, right? Is Ruan online? Ruan joined? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, right. Hi, Ruan. Hello. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Sri Lanka College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, uh, as a part of our CME program, Dr. Shamun Malin has organized this series of webinars. And today we have a very important uh, topic and an important special guest uh, who has contributed a lot to Sri Lankan obstetric practice while he is placed in UK. He is uh, none other than one of our own, Dr. Juan Fernando. Uh, he is a consultant, obstetrician gynecologist and urogynecologist gynecologist subspecialist uh, from Imperial College. And he's a honorary senior lecturer, Imperial College, London. And he has res his research expertise on uh, urogynecological and perineal injury. And he has done a lot of publication and work and training all around the world. And we are fortunate to have him in on our pre-Congress workshop also. Uh, without talking much about Ruan, let me introduce the person. Uh, let me introduce to Dr. Shamun Malin to introduce our speaker today, who is going to talk us about management of perineal injury following childbirth. One of the very important topics a trainee should know because this is an unaddressed past, uh, part in the past, but um, leading to silent morbidity in many women. So uh, Ruan has done a lot of research in this area with his uh, peers. And uh, so... Uh, let's uh, see what he has to do about this perineal injury and how we should manage in ideal setting. So over to you, Shamoon. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, Professor Dadam uh, Good evening, um, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Juan Fernando. And good, good evening to everyone who's logged in uh, today uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Juan Fernando, who kindly agreed to deliver this webinar on the management of a perineal injury following childbirth. So Dr. Juan Fernando, he obtained his MBBS and his MS in obstetrics and gynecology from the University of Colombo and his MRCOG in 1997, and then went on to obtain his FRCOG in 2013. He was awarded a Doctor of Medicine degree from Kiel University for his thesis titled Management of Obstetric Anal Spint Injuries in 2005. He has also won several prizes, including the Harold Malkin Prize for the Best Original Research Award by the RCOG in 2006. He has also published over 75 peer-reviewed papers and several book chapters. He's the principal author of the RCOG guidelines on management of third and fourth degree perineal tears. Dr. Juan Fernando is currently a consultant obstetrician and a urogynecology subspecialist at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, St. Mary's Hospital London, and the co-director of the urogynecology subspe subspeciality training program at St. Mary's Hospital London. He's also an honorary senior lecturer and an undergraduate personal tutor at the Imperial College London. He was a member of the RCOG Guideline Committee, RCOG Scientific Advisory Committee, FIGO Pelvic Floor Dysfunction Group, and the International Continent Society Ethics Committee. 
He's currently a member of the Education Committee of the International Continent Society. Uh, I would now like to uh, hand over this uh, to Dr. Juan Fernando to proceed with delivering his uh, lecture, uh, which is much awaited. Thank you. Thank you, Shimon. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dadapala. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, connect with the, the Sri Lankan obstetricians and the trainees, uh, uh, even though I'm here. Uh, so, uh, and good evening uh, for you all. Uh, let me start this by sharing the video. Uh, Is Dr. Juan Fernando. Well, he, he lost his connectivity, so I think he had to rejoin. <coughs> yeah, he is not joined, right? Yeah, he's there. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Let me share my... Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Ruan, yeah. you can hear Okay, me. so let's go to the lecture. Right, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, I can't see the controls of the... Okay, right, let's just share this. Right, I think we are nearly there. Is it on full screen now? Can you see the full screen? Ah, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's okay, Ruan. Now things are better. Right. Okay, sorry about that. It's right. Okay. So, um, uh, like uh, Professor Dampala mentioned, that perineal injury following childbirth is a 
fairly neglected area. Even when I started my research maybe 15 years ago, it was not an area where everybody, uh, a lot of people were interested in. So um, let me just go through some uh, epidemiological and uh, factors and some statistics. So these are the, um, uh, the trend of first, second and third degree tears or the uh, between 20 to 20, uh, uh, between 2000 to 2011. You can see the important one is the bottom line. The green line is um, where the third degree tear rate has increased by three folds. And similarly, uh, the second degree tears also have been in significantly increased. The first degree tears has been pretty much uh, stable. The main reason for the increase in the third and fourth degree tears is the importance of the recognition because, uh, uh, because of the teaching and the training, a lot of people tend to recognize the third and fourth degree tears. And then the other important aspect is the litigation. So um, uh, in, in Sri Lanka, the litigation is uh, not that uh, common, but I think it's, it's, it's upcoming. But in, in, in UK, this is one of the, the commonest uh, causes for uh, litigation, uh, perennial tear following childbirth. So these are some of the examples of the, the websites from the solicitors or the lawyers to show them that like they are, they are always available and, and no be no fee basis so they can always claim. So this is, uh, this is a document from the NHS uh, litigation authority. So they look after all the medical legal aspects uh, in all the specialties. So uh, this, is a, this is a very good uh, report and they update in regular basis. So these are the, the top 10 categories of claimed by numbers between uh, April uh, 2000 to 2010. And as you can see from the obstetric point of view, apart from, from the management of labor cesarean section and cerebral palsy, the litigation or claims um, by, because of the perineal trauma is the fourth commonest cause for uh, litigation. So it's fairly common. And then if you look into details, the, the causes for litigation, so these are the causes for litigation following perineal trauma. So incontinence of fetal, fecal uh, fe uh, feces or flatus, vaginal discharge, rectovaginal fistula requiring repair, and colostomy and psychiatric damage. So these are fairly um, serious um, issues and uh, cost-wise also they end up with having a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, money or, or claims. So the, the ugly, uh, allegations of the negligence includes failure to consider cesarean section at the appropriate time. So they don't listen to the patient or they don't go ahead with the C-section. They went ahead with the vaginal birth and then uh, failure to perform or extend the episiotomy. The third important cause is the failure to diagnose the true extent and the grade of the injury, including failure to perform a rectal examination. I think this is a very important, um, important aspect in terms of the identification and preventing subsequent complications. The bottom part of this slide is um, to highlight the fact that most all the claims are bought for perineal trauma focus on the events which takes place immediately following delivery by the way of examination and repair rather than on the delivery itself. It's not just the delivery if you do a forceps delivery or if you do a, a one twos delivery. So that is not the cause for the, the, the negligence or the claim. It is the, the events after the delivery by uh, the fact that uh, I'm inability to uh, examine and repair the tear. So this is, a, this is another, uh, another slide to highlight the facts. They were midwife managed claims and the doctor managed claims. So both you can see the incorrect classification. For instance, the, 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 amongst the midwife managed claims, the third and fourth degree tear has been classified as a first degree tear in about 10 cases. So similarly, even amongst the, uh, the doctor managed claims, uh, third degree tear has been classified as a first degree tear in nine instances. So these are the examples of 
the causes for litigation, so which, is, which is important to keep it in your mind. So this is an example of a patient which I saw maybe about uh, eight, nine months ago. So actually this patient herself is a, uh, is a lawyer. So she just came because uh, um, she, she couldn't control the, the feces. Or anything. So I thought maybe just she had a third degree tear and it's not being uh, stitched properly, but actually she actually had a cloacal defect. So there, there was no perineum between the rectum and the vagina. So this is this entire area is, a, is, a, is, a, is a opening. So there was about two centimeter gap between the two. So this, this is another example. So this is, this is the rectum and this is the vagina. So there is no gap between the two. And she eventually had a, a stoma. She had a colostomy, defunctioning colostomy. And then um, she had to have that for about uh, six months. Then we did a secondary sphincter repair. And uh, then the, the colostomy was reversed. And uh, then subsequently she had the second baby. She had a, a elective cesarean section. And um, so she is almost completely um, symptom free. So this is just to give you an example of the, the, the severity of the problems you come across if you don't diagnose them in time. So uh, this is a good um, uh, article uh, by Evans in 2019, which showed the impact of anal sphincter injuries. So you have now as, as, uh, as obstetricians or as, as um, physicians, we look only into the medical aspect. So anal incontinence, the fecal in, uh, urgency, the dyspareunia, and the prolonged recovery, pain and discomfort. But in addition, there is psychological impact. So this kind of patients will have a lot of psychological impact, of course, uh, ongoing symptoms, then it affects their mental health, then they, it affects their, their uh, intimate relationships, and then it impacts on the uh, view of the birth and then embarrassment. Then they have social impact, social limitations, limitation or sort of exercise restrictions, delayed or return to work. And then of course the healthcare impact, of course, uh, the future, future deliveries, which will uh, probably end up with having uh, operative uh, deliveries. So this is, a, 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 a good example of how it impacts on uh, physical, psychological, social, as well as the healthcare impact from the anal sphincter injuries. So this is the, the, the same um, paper. They looked into the um, uh, four years after the uh, anal sphincter injuries. So about 38% complained of significant overall bowel symptoms. 34% complains of fatal incontinence or fecal urgency, about 19% fecal incontinence, and then about one third of them will have a daily impact on daily life uh, in more uh, areas. 100 of women had for the further children, 50% uh, reported that their delivery impact was, um, delivery choice was impacted by the previous anal sphincter injury one third opted for cesarean section. So that's the background. So that's the importance of the perineal trauma, the importance of identifying it um, uh, accordingly and then repairing it accordingly to prevent further complications long-term. So the classification of perineal tears, I'm sure you all have gone through this. And so we all know the, the, the classification. So the first degree tear is the vaginal epithelium. And then second degree tear involves perineal muscles. And third degree tear involves anal sphincter. So this is subdivided into 3A, 3B, and 3C. So the 3A is less than 50% of the external sphincter thickness. 3B is more than 50% of the external anal sphincter thickness is damaged. And 3C includes internal sphincter. The fourth degree tear is the uh, involvement of the anal epithelium. So the basically the fourth degree tear involves the vagina up to the rectum, uh, uh, involving all layers. So uh, the third degree tears and the fourth degree tears collectively um, uh, called as obstetric anal sphincter injuries or in, in short, OASIS. There is another uh, type of a tear, which is not included in this group, which is the buttonhole tear. So this is where the tear is involved only the anal mucosa with intact anal sphincter complex, which is called the buttonhole tear. 
but this is supposed this is this has to be documented separately because by definition this is not a third or fourth digit error because the sphincter is intact but the important thing is if it's not recognized and then repaired and this type of tear can cause endovaginal fistula so this is an example of a uh, this is an example of a buttonhole tear so you can see this part this is the anal sphincter sphincter is intact and the arrow, the white arrow shows the, the finger in the rectum, which showed uh, the breach in the mucosa above the anal sphincter. So this is about the guidelines. In fact, we updated in uh, June 2015. At the moment, we are, we are currently updating at the moment. So if you look at the time frame, which takes to update a guideline, we have to update it. So we probably take about maybe be six months to go through all the literature and then we have to submit to the, the the committee then they send it for the peer review and then the peer review they they come back with all their comments and the questions and everything so this will go to and for for about a few months so eventually by the time it is published it takes at least about two years from the original update so this is just to give you an idea so now the, the, now the important facts about the, how, what are the risk factors and how we can prevent. So Asian ethnicity is found to be one of the, one of the risk factors if you look at the literature. Now the different difficulties, the different uh, studies have dif uh, reported outcomes in different ways. So it is very difficult to put these information all together. But overall, if you are as, uh, Asian ethnicity have a higher risk of ending up having third or fourth digit tears. It's mostly because the, the perineal um, body or the perineal, the, the distance between the, the, the rectum and the, the vagina is smaller in uh, Asian uh, women. So that is probably one of the reasons why the Asian ethnicity is a risk factor. Of course, the nulliparous women, because they are, the perineum and the pelvis is not being adjusted. So they have, they have a much higher risk of ending up having a third degree tear. Birth weight great, greater than four kilograms, shoulder dystocia, occipital posterior positions, and the prolonged labor. And the other important thing is the instrumental delivery. If it's a Vontus delivery without episiotomy carries a higher risk, then Vontus delivery with episiotomy is having a lower risk, then the forceps delivery carries a higher risk. And the, the, the combined forceps and one tooth delivery carries a much higher risk. So then everybody asks, oh, can we predict anal sphincter injuries like giving you uh, like a scoring system or something? Unfortunately, nothing much has been done on this, and this is probably the only available uh, study uh, looking to the uh, predictors of anal sphincter injuries with uh, using uh, multiple regression analysis. So they come up with this kind of uh, like a scoring system. So if you can see that if you're Asian, you have a higher risk because they have given two points for that. Similarly, duration of second stage labor more than 180 minutes, you get uh, 10, uh, sorry, you get two points in nulliparous, but in multiparous women, you get 15 points. So that means if you are a multiparous woman with uh, more than three hours second stage, you have a high risk of developing renal sphincter injuries. Then episiotomy, of course, we don't practice the midline episiotomy, but mainly the US, they practice the midline episiotomy. So that is another risk factor. Then the mode of delivery, if it's operative vaginal delivery, you have a high risk than previous history of obstetric anal sphincter. They have given uh, uh, two points for the, uh, if it's a multiparous. So this is the, um, the, the conclusion of the, the study uh, because they have found that um, about uh, ma the majority of the patients who have scored uh, more than six have, uh, have got about 25% risk of anal sphincter injuries. The next question is, can this be prevented? So at the moment, there, are, there aren't many uh, interventions to prevent the anal sphincter injuries. So what we have suggested in the guidelines, because you can see these are evidence C and D, most of, the, most of these, 
uh, the medial lateral episiotomy should be considered for instrumental deliveries. When episiotomy is indicated, the medial lateral technique is recommended with careful attention to ensure that the angle is 60 degrees away from the midline when the perineum is distended. Because although we assume that we give a 60 degree angle midline episiotomy, most of the studies have shown that the actual, uh, the angle which you get is less than or more closer towards the midline. So that's why the, the, there is a um, uh, specific uh, scissors have designed. We will come to that in a minute. Then perineal protection at the crowning. So when you support the perineum at the crowning, that would help to prevent the uh, inner sphincter injuries. And then the warm compression during the second stage of the labor also found to have reduced the uh, inner sphincter injuries. So this is the, um, the scissors which I mentioned earlier. It's called Episcissor 60. You can see this is the prototype where the, the, this is the midline and this is where the, the scissors is angled in such a way. Once you put this, the guide in the middle, it will give you the exactly 60%, uh, sorry, 60 degree angle of the episiotomy. So there are five studies um, looking into the uh, use of uh, uh, episcissors. So the, the conclusions were that introduction of episcissors when combined with other preventative measures, including manual perineal protection, can reduce the inner sphincter by up to about 50%. And all the studies, the operator were able to consistently achieve in the post-suturing episiotomy angle more than 60%. So it seems to be um, uh, a one way of avoiding too much of uh, episiotomy going too much into the midline and giving you the, the right um, angle for the episiotomy and avoiding or reducing the perineal trauma, uh, third and fourth degree tears. So this is the manual protection. So we all have seen this I and mean, we all have done this, but um, I think this came up uh, maybe 20 years ago. Um, some of the midwives say everything has to be hands, hands free, hands off. And then uh, they, they let the patients who deliver everything, uh, deliver without any support, ending up having lots of um, uh, increased incidence of perineal trauma. So what happens, so this is the study which was done in the Scandinavian country. You can see in Norway, in, in 2000, around 2000, they implemented the perineal protection program. And you can see there has been a significant reduction in the third and fourth degree tears. So, Again, the perineal protection, um, there were five randomized control studies and seven non-randomized studies. But the conclusion was, although there was um, evidence to suggest that it reduces the uh, risk of anal sphincter injuries, but overall conclusion was there was not enough evidence to suggest that um, perineal protection uh, is uh, reducing the anal sphincter injuries, but it has suggested that you need more randomized control trials. So the warm compression, warm, warm compression during the second stage. So this is based on a small um, um, number of women, two studies. They found that warm compress significantly reduced the risk of third and fourth degree tears. But the problem is there you, you can't, um, you can't quantify the, the warm compression. So these studies, all they have, they have just mentioned the warm compression, but there is no standardization of the, the, the amount of the, the, the temperature. So if you apply too much of temperature, they might end up with having burns and everything. So although in theory, this seems to be working. So this is something, again, we have to um, work and go do further studies to confirm this finding. Now, you may have seen or you may have heard about the RCOG OSIS care bundle. So this is again to uh, implement and make the awareness of the women who is going through the, the vaginal birth and about the anal sphincter injuries. So the, there are four key elements of the uh, RCOG OSIS care bundle. First thing is to inform the women about anal sphincter injuries and what steps can be taken to minimize the risk. So everybody who comes into the, who decide out of a general birth, so we give the information about the anal sphincter injuries. And then the second step is when indicated, 
A episiotomy should be performed mediolaterally at six degree angle at crowning. So this is where if available, you can use the epicesis, but uh, which definitely give you a 60 degree angle away from the midline. Otherwise, you have to be careful when you, when you give the episiotomy. Then documented use of manual perineal protection. So this is where the, the manual perineal protection is important. So there are different videos available in the college website to uh, give you a, show you exactly how manual protection is uh, applied. And so this is where something, uh, even in the Sri Lankan settings, uh, especially the, the midwives, if they, when they deliver their babies, I think they also should be um, informed and they should be shown how to properly do the manual protection, which itself will help to reduce the third and fourth digit tear. Then the fourth one is the perineum should be examined at for any tears and graded according to the RCOG guidelines. And then examine should include a rectal examination. So that is important. Even though it appears to be intact, you need to do a rectal examination and it should be documented. So these are the four key elements of the RCOG care bundle. So I'm going to show you a video just to um, show you the, um, the, the identification of perineal trauma. So let's see, I'm sure you'll be able to see this. Followed by a rectal examination. During the rectal examination, one should ensure that there are no tears There are no tears involving the rectal mucosa that may be communicating with the vagina. If there is any doubt, combined rectal and vaginal examination should be performed. The diagnosis of anal sphincter injury can be facilitated by asking the woman to squeeze the anal sphincter to check for a contraction. Note that some patients with regional analgesia may not be able to do this. The anal sphincter should also be palpated with the index finger in the anal canal and the thumb over the anal sphincter. By using a pill rolling movement between nine o'clock and three o'clock, the integrity of the anal sphincter can be established. As shown here, although the anal skin was torn down to the anal verge, the external anal sphincter is intact. By grasping and retracting the external anal sphincter, the conjoint longitudinal fibers are visible and by dividing these, the internal sphincter can be demonstrated. Here we see the external anal sphincter retracted to demonstrate the intact internal anal sphincter. Here we see a normal intact external sphincter that is about 2.5 centimeters in length. The forceps grasp the transverse peroneal muscles, which should not be confused with the external sphincter. The internal sphincter is demonstrated beneath the external sphincter. We will now demonstrate third and fourth degree tears. In the first example, the external sphincter has a superficial tear, and this will be classified as a grade 3A tear. The external anal sphincter is under tonic contraction, and therefore, if disrupted, will retract within its capsule and may therefore not be visible. Analysis forceps should then be used to grasp the external sphincter. The external sphincter is surrounded by a capsule, lateral to which lies an important landmark, the ischioanal fat. The ischioanal fat is again demonstrated at superficial level and now at a deeper level. We are now looking at a 3B tear and the pink internal sphincter can be seen through the partially torn external sphincter fibers. Here we see an example of a grade 3B tear in which the residual intact fibers of the external sphincter are demonstrated. In this grade 3B tear, almost all of the external anal sphincter has been disrupted and the internal sphincter is clearly visible. The color contrast between the external anal sphincter and the internal anal sphincter is highlighted in this example of a 3B tear. The deep red color of the completely torn external sphincter contrasts with the pink color of the internal sphincter and the paler anal epithelium. We are now viewing a fourth degree tear in which the torn pink internal sphincter is clearly visible.
An example of an isolated buttonhole tear of the rectal mucosa is now being shown. This is not a fourth degree tear as the anal sphincters are intact. We now demonstrate how a third degree tear could be missed if a rectal examination is not performed. By inserting the finger into the rectum, the torn external sphincter becomes apparent with only a thin intact strip of external sphincter proximal to which the external sphincter is completely torn. This is a 3B tear. In this case, the perineal skin is intact, but by performing a rectal and vaginal examination, it can be seen that there is a tear just inside the posterior fourchette. Upon exploration, this was in fact a third degree tear. Failure to diagnose a third or fourth degree tear has serious consequences, resulting in a deficient perineum and sphincter, leading to a clovical defect as shown here. Followed by a rectal exam. I think, um, uh, did, did you all see that video clearly? I don't know how the, how, how the video seen remotely. It was clear, uh, Dr. Ron Fernando. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I mean, that yeah, summarizes, it's, 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 that summarizes yeah. the, the classification as well as the clerical defect and how to identify what the classification is. So, uh, then we go into the repair of the inner sphincter injuries. So I'm just going to go through briefly the general principles. So it should be done by an appropriately trained clinician. Sometimes, I mean, in, in, in UK, uh, very experienced midwife sometimes will be able to repair that as far as they have undergone all the training and everything. But most of the time, it's the, it's the at the senior registrar level or if the um, um, junior registrars, if they have been attending the courses and have been supervised. So it should be appropriately trained clinicians and, and it should be done in a theater under regional or general anesthesia with good lighting and with appropriate instruments. So we have a third degree tear repair pack, which includes all the retractors, the Alice forceps and everything. So, um, and then um, obviously the rectal examination, which we have mentioned before, uh, should be um, performed after the repair. Uh, before the repair, first to identify the exact degree of the tear. And after the repair, uh, rectal examination should be performed to make sure that your sutures have not gone through the inner rectal mucosa. If it happens, you just have to undo it and then repair it again. Then um, the repair tech, which technique should be um, used to repair the anal mucosa. So the torn anal uh, mucosa in fourth degree tears can be used with either continuous or interrupted techniques. And we would normally recommend to use the, the knot into the anal canal. Uh, this is basically we've been based on this on colorectal surgeon's advice. And then for the repair of the internal anal sphincter, because internal anal sphincter is a very thin um, layer of muscles, so you can't overlap it. So what we normally do is we would just advise to do an interrupted or metra sutures to make sure that the internal anal sphincter is uh, properly sutured. Uh, later in my lecture, there will be some examples of the missed internal sphincter and how it affects the symptoms. Then with regards to the external anal sphincter, there are two techniques. I mean, uh, the, the colorectal surgeons used to overlap it to, um, during the secondary sphincter repairs. And then so the, the studies have shown that at the moment, the evidence suggests either use it either end to end or overlap uh, carries a, a similar kind of outcome. But uh, I mean, personally, I would use the uh, um, overlap technique because it gives you a good muscle chunk uh, once you repair. Then the important thing is the documentation. So this is an example of a 1A4 sheet paper where we used in most of our hospitals here, which includes, I'll go one by one, uh, the, the record of the trauma, obviously the patient's information, then the, the definition or the classification of the the tear, this could be just a first degree tear, it could be a second degree tear, and if it could be a third degree tear or fourth degree tear. So this, by doing this, 
you won't miss you will miss the, the, the classification. And then um, again, apart from the perineum, then you have to look into the other areas whether there are any labial involvement, there's a vaginal tear, whether there is a paraurethral tear, where there's a clitoral tear. So you have the diagram, so you can, you can document that. Then you go to the, the anesthetic, then uh, each anatomical layer, the vagina, the perineal muscles, the perineal skin, internal sphincter, external sphincter, and the epithelium, the method of repair, and then the suture material used. Then of course, the antibiotics, the laxatives, the analgesics, and then the rectal examination, then uh, the number of needles, the swabs, estimated blood loss, then the advice after the repair. So all these are um, documented in one, one page. And most of us now we have the electronic um, patient records. So instead of writing it down, so we all have this form incorporated into the perineal repair or uh, perineal repair section of the delivery notes. So it is more or less a free text or just the tick box for some of the aspects. So that is very important. I think this is something which you can, uh, if, you, if it's not being implemented in Sri Lanka at the moment, I'm, I'm not sure. If not, this is something which, which, which is very easy, just a, a, a page of A4 sheet, and then it's easy for you to do the audits as well. So at the, because here, of course, one of the important audits uh, every, every, every few months is at the Danforth degree tears. So they use this performer and the data. So it's very easy to collect the data. Then the other important is the post-operative management. So how we should follow them up. So again, there is no hard and fast rule. So uh, usually, uh, uh, after the after the uh, anal sphincter injury has been repaired, we should give them the broad spectrum antibiotic to prevent any uh, risk of post-operative infection and wound dehiscence. And then uh, post-operative laxatives is recommended to reduce the wound dehiscence because of this hard stools. And then uh, the for, with regards to the antibiotics, the laxatives. Uh, should be according to the local guidelines because uh, the, depending on the hospital, you will have different guidelines on what antibiotics to give. Then how women with anal sphincter injuries manage post-operatively? Physiotherapy is advised. So this is something um, we, because of course here we have the women, women cell physiotherapists, they have a regular appointments about six to eight eight weeks after the uh, after the delivery, and then so they will advise on how to uh, strengthen the pelvic floor. Now the other important thing is how we follow them, specifically the the patients with anal sphincter injuries. How we follow them up. Now again, there are different models, but in in our hospital we have uh, we'll I'll come to that in a minute. So we have a dedicated perineal clinic. We go through all the investigations. And so this is, a, this is what we do in our, our pelvic floor clinic. So it's a dedicated one-stop clinic. We see the patients between eight to 12 weeks after third and fourth degree tear. It's not only for women with third and fourth degree tear. It's, uh, we see the patients with, with perineal wound dehiscence and any bowel, uh, bowel problems after the delivery, any kind of immediate postpartum uh, problems. Then we use the symptoms assessed with validated questionnaires. We take a history and examination. Then we carry out endoanal ultrasound scan and anal manometry. Uh, the, the patients who had a previous third and fourth degree tears, we see them around the mid trimester. We discuss about the future deliveries. Then we have the colorectal surgeon available if uh, advice if available if necessary. Uh, then we also follow up women with who had previous third degree tears. So this is, I'll give you some um, examples of the investigations we do. So we do the anal uh, anorectal manometry because this is, this is not a detailed anorectal manometry, which is normally done by the colorectal surgeons, but this is a very simple, straightforward manometry where we just assess the resting pressure and the squeeze pressure along the anal sphincter canal. So this is an example of this, this red line. So this is the example of the, the um, normal anal manometry. So this is the resting pressure. So you, you put a very fine uh, pressure transducer into the rectum and then at the, at the sphincter level. Uh, so this is the resting pressure. So normally it should be around 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. And this is the squeeze pressure. 
should be the double the resting pressure. So normally it's about 70, above 75 to 80 millimeters of mercury. And so this is an example of a normal endovenal ultrasound scan. So, so this thick white ring is the external sphincter. Then thin black ring is the internal sphincter. Then inside that is this is the anal mucosa and this is the probe. So that's a normal intact uh, anal sphincter complex. That's the external sphincter, that's the internal sphincter. So these are some examples of uh, uh, sphincter defects. So you can see compared to the previous one. So there is an external sphincter defect between these yellow arrows. So compared to here. So here you can see it's, it's nice and, and very dense area. So this is the area where there is a defect. So similarly here. So these are the kind of defects which we see them in either partly uh, repaired or missed third or fourth degree tears. So this is an example of a patient who has both external and internal anal sphincter defects. So this is the resting pressure is about 20 and the squeeze pressure is very, very little, very, very little, it's about maybe 30. So you can see that, so the patient's resting pressure as well as squeeze pressure is low. So this is an example of an isolated internal sphincter defect. So you can see, so that the external sphincter is intact. So from here to here, you can see that there is no internal sphincter. So internal sphincter is the whatever the left is retracted. So it's more like a semicircular uh, kind of appearance. So this kind of a patients, because the, the, the squeeze pressure is mainly by the external sphincter. So you can see their, their squeeze pressure is reasonably well, but their uh, resting pressure is very low. Resting pressure is mainly maintained by the internal sphincter. So resting pressure is low, about 20. So this type of patients, so this is a classical example of a missed 3C tear. So they may have recognized the external sphincter defect, but the internal sphincter defect was missed. So that's why there's been a defect. So that also can lead into, um, that also can lead into um, uh, symptoms such as fecal, fecal soiling. Right, then the next question is everybody asks, so how we should manage this patient in their, in their future deliveries? Again, there are, uh, there, there are a few studies coming up, very, very, very limited um, evidence we have. So we, at the beginning, we recommended that the, all the patients should be counseled. And then um, if they have, um, if they have, so they have they have symptomatic. If they have any problem controlling the bowels, like fecal urgency or fecal incontinence, or have abnormal endovenal ultrasound scan findings or abnormal manometry, that means if there are any inner sphincter defects or if the pressures are low, then we should be counseling them for cesarean delivery. So based on um, so this is this is a summary. So we we, we review the patients in the pelvic floor clinic. We use the validated questionnaires, endovenal scan, manometry. And then if, the, if they are asymptomatic, normal ultrasound scan, normal manometry, a love vaginal birth. If they have symptomatic or abnormal ultrasound scan or abnormal manometry, then we would recommend cesarean section. So based on this, we did this study. We uh, actually, in fact, it's ongoing study. So we uh, analyzed in 2015 with 200, uh, 428 patients. Then um, 370, 327 patients followed up with the questionnaire. And then um, there were 25 patients who were asymptomatic, normal scan, normal manometry. And 22 patients had vaginal birth and three had emergency cesarean section. All these 25 patients were asymptomatic. There were no new defect and normal scan. Then if they were uh, symptomatic or if they had abnormal scans, abnormal manometry, we recommended them to have elective cesarean section. Those two 24 patients, they were asymptomatic. There were no new defects. But two, uh, three of them, well, two had an emergency C-sections and one had normal delivery. Uh, and all these three patients had low anal sphincter pressures after the second delivery. So, I mean, this is just to give you an example. So um, how we should manage, again, there's limited uh, evidence, but this is, if you follow this, uh, 
this algorithm for the time being, I think that would help us to prevent further deterioration of the symptoms. Now, the recurrence of anal sphincter injury. So this is another question everybody asks, every patient asks. So, the, so there is a, a retrospective uh, analysis of primary who had uh, anal sphincter injuries during the singleton term cephalic vaginal deliveries and had a subsequent deliveries. So there were 2,272 patients met the criteria and 10% developed vaginally had a repeat anal sphincter injuries. So, um, I mean, this is so based on this study, we normally tell the patient, if you, if you sustained a third degree tear in the past, a recurrence rate of the second third degree tear is about 10%. Provided, provided that there is the, the provided that there is uh, the birth weight is normal and then there is no uh, abnormalities like no no issues like uh, birth weight more than four kilos which increases the risk and uh, instrumental deliveries which also increases the risk so the conclusion from these studies women with previous anal sphincter sphinx are at the uh, at increased risk of recurrence is about 10 percent increase in the risk and more liberal use of medial lateral episiotomy in the subsequent delivery could significantly reduce the risk of recurrence. So you can see these are very early stages. Again, uh, uh, important aspect to look into, but we don't have much of evidence. I think the other important aspect is the litigation, uh, like I mentioned in the past. So if there is a, if, if somebody um, claim about the negligence, then you all go through the uh, notes first. So it should be a clear guidelines and it should be documented. If you use that document, which I mentioned earlier, it would be very useful. It's a single page. All the information is there. And so that would um, that would give you like a defend you in terms of I mean, there's a litigation because if you have done everything according to this, then the, 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 the negligence is less. So the conclusions. Perineal trauma in general and specifically anal sphincter injuries associated with significant morbidity. There is increased litigation and there is limited evidence. So what we should do, we should follow the guidelines, aware of the complications, explain the patient adequately. So that is something very important. So if the patient knows what exactly happened and they, what what to expect. I think that is a very important thing. In the, in the college website, there is a specific patient information leaflet after the uh, anal sphincter injuries and perineal trauma. So this, this type of uh, uh, patient information is important. Then the patient understands what's going on. I think that is something um, even in Sri Lanka, I think uh, you should be able to implement. These are, these are not high tech stuff. So it's very important. You can translate into Sinhalese and, and uh, you, you, can, you can literally translate the English version of the um, RCOG patient information and uh, translate it to Sinhalese and give, give the patient because they are aware of it. Then the documentation, like I mentioned, the follow-up. And second opinion or expert advice, always get that if you are not sure. Because I think part of the problem is that um, he, of course, if uh, I get the referrals from, from uh, uh, like even other hospitals, especially if they don't have any symptoms or if they are, if they're not sure what exactly happening, so then you get a second opinion. Then we, we discuss and we have the MDT. So we discuss in the MDTs and then decide this is the best way forward. And of course, training and research, which is very important. Um, I've been um, doing uh, quite a few uh, workshops uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka with uh, Professor Hemant Sen and I. Before the COVID, then I think after COVID hits, everything was um, um, came to a halt. But these are the important things, the training and the research, because there, there are a lot of areas. If you look into the, the, my lecture, there are so many areas where you can think, ah, we can do something on this. We can, we can, we can look into this. Um, I, I think especially from the trainees uh, point of view, that is something you can you can think and you you can you can um, think something and then um, have a chat with your boss and I'm, I'm more than happy to help you if you if you need any any advice or any help. So I think that's all I have to uh, say. Um, 
I think, is there any um, time for questions, Shimon? Yes, uh, Shimon. There is, there is a time. Uh, we have, uh, there some questions that have come up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, can you see the questions? Yes, I can see. Yes, I can see. Um, shall I just uh, shall I just uh, tell the um, question and answer? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, please. So, Sakuntala Asian is that all Asians or mostly East Asians? Well, there are some studies uh, uh, which shows um, uh, like uh, East Asian, like more like uh, Thailand, Philippines. But there are quite a few more studies amongst the Indians and uh, in Indians and more like a South Asian uh, uh, group. So both both groups uh, have a high risk of uh, the DBTAS. And uh, the second question is, is J-shaped episiotomy no longer recommended? Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what the J-shape, because uh, I think what you meant probably is, is the kind of uh, uh, episiotomy where you, you do more of a midline and then away from the, then away from the, uh, you you can't you do a smaller midline incision and then going away, is is that what you mean? So if that's the case, so again, if you because even if you make a small incision in the midline, it can extend into the sphincter. So that's why we specifically request from the from the point where the scissors is inserted, you give a sixty degree. Then oh, what what's the sutures used in the sphincter repairs? I think I may have slipped that slide. Sorry. So uh, for the for the anal epithelium, uh, we avoid using the PDS because it's a fairly uh, 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 very sharp and monofilament suture, so it can cause a lot of irritation. For the anal sphincter, we use uh, we use PDS, uh, rather sorry, we use Vitrin. And then for the anal sphincter, we we would recommend uh, use PDS because it takes longer to dissolve than the uh, white ring. So it should be the PDS for internal sphincter and the external sphincter. Then uh, is there any use of the ultrasound scan after delivery? Now there are, there are a few uh, studies to uh, which, we, which, which have done uh, to do the ultrasound scan um, after the delivery. But I think um, it is if you're, if you're not sure, yes, you can do internal ultrasound scan, but the practicality, it's not freely available. So that, that, that is the important thing because unless you're using it as a, at, a, at a research setting, uh, most of the hospitals, they don't have the internal ultrasound scan unless um, you have a dedicated clinic like, clinic like us. Then oh, uh, the other one is how to repair the buttonhole tears. So the buttonhole tears is um, you, your sphincter is intact. So you're basically your sphincter is intact. So what you need to do is you need to use a retractor. So expand and then get into the, um, the area where the, the mucosa is damaged. Then you use it like a normal, um, when you repair like a fourth degree tear. So you can use the, um, the sutures and preferably put the knot inside and then use either continuous or uh, uh, interrupted sutures. Sometimes if it is very difficult, um, I mean, for, for so, some, some places, if they don't have enough expertise, they call the colorectal surgeon. And the, the problem is the moment you call the colorectal surgeon, they want to uh, do a stoma. But uh, the smaller buttonhole repairs, you can easily, easily suture. Um, so the only important thing is to expose. You need to expose it properly. And then um, update about the suture material used for the external anal sphincter repair. So I, I briefly mentioned that. It's the, uh, the we would recommend uh, to PDS for that. Uh, yes, yeah, so what the exact size, yeah, that's a two PDS. Uh, the repair of the buttonhole injury, which I think I have, Expand. 
If a primary repair failure of episiotomy repair, what are the options? Is a second intention to heal recommended? Yes. So that's a very good question because if it depends on how big it is. So if they, I mean, we all have seen the episiotomy is being broken down. So the important thing is if it's a smaller one, yes, you can, uh, the, if the depth is small, you can leave it uh, for the secondary intention healing, provided you give some antibiotics, make sure that it's healed, but you need to, you need to follow them up uh, fairly regularly, maybe every two weeks or so, make sure that it's healing properly. But if it's, if it's a deep one, then um, you need to do uh, the, the pretty much uh, secondary repair but you have to make sure there is no infection. So you need to make sure you need to you need to have a look until the the wound is nice and you know uh, with well granulated um, area without any slough. Then that's the time to repair the uh, infected episiotomy wound uh, because otherwise it will break down again. Is there any benefits of sits bath in for uh, must be it must be salt bath, isn't it? So salt bath. Uh, soul bath in post-operative management. Well, this is something well with the soul bath, one thing is you can't quantify. So, um, and the other thing is um, sometimes it could be very painful. So um, it's not generally being recommended. Is there a possibility of internal sphincter damage without external sphincter damage? Uh, it, it is almost impossible because if you look at the anatomy, to damage the internal sphincter, external things, it has to go through the external sphincter first. So if somebody claims that uh, if you do a scan, like the one I like mentioned, the internal sphincter only damage, no, it is the missed uh, internal sphincter. So it has to go through the external sphincter first before goes into the internal sphincter. I think a lot of people have uh, asked about the, the question of the repair of the buttonhole tear. I think I, I um, if you need further clarification, please let me know. Unfortunately, I don't have a I don't have a video of that because it's it's so so um, so rare. But the principle is like I explained. Um, use the use the retract. I mean, like the thyroid retractor is a, is a good one. So you you retract that, then you can see the you can see the sphincter. You can see the intact sphincter then you just expose that. Then you can see that you put your finger underneath from the rectum, then you can see the gap. And then maybe you can use some um, Alice forceps to hold onto the, the, the two ends of the torn mucosa. Then you can suture the um, uh, suture that uh, torn in a epithelium. Sometimes this situation, uh, burying the knot in the mucosa can be difficult. If it's difficult, even it, it's fine because if you are using uh, if you are using uh, um, like absorbable sutures, that should be fine. And uh, regarding the size of the suture materials, I think I mentioned it's it's to a PDS uh, buttonhole. Uh, so what time? Uh, excuse me, I have to avoid medial lateral thing in there will cause destruction of the Bartholin's duct and cutting down vertically. Uh, before lateral. Well, uh, the Bartholin's duct is out of the way from the, so this is the, the question from Sakuntala Senaviratna. That's what I meant. Still in Sri Lanka, I see people avoiding medial lateral thinking they will cause destruction of Bartholin's duct and cutting down vertically first before lateral. And I, I don't think the Bartholin's duct is anywhere near the that area, isn't it? What's your stance on prophylactic episiotomy in preventing tears? Yes, so now this is, <coughs> so the, 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 if you're obviously, if you're, if you're using instrumental deliveries, then the studies have shown that uh, episiotomy uh, during the instrumental deliveries reduces the risk. Then if you're not using episiotomies, that is your clinical judgment. So personally, I would, if especially if it's in a prime hip, uh, obviously I think there is a much higher chance that it will there is a there's going to be a tear. I always give a, a medial lateral PCOTM. But if it's a multi, we have like two or three deliveries before, and then um, when when you when you do when you do the delivery, if there is a less risk of uh, developing a tear, then 
um, you can avoid giving a episiotomy. Then the needle size, I think it just comes with the, the standard, if you, if you come with the standard uh, uh, two OPDS, that's the standard size. Actually, um, more finer needles are, I mean, here, of course, it's available in the finer needles, but I'm not sure whether uh, the, this size of, uh, I, I'm sure two, uh, two OPDS is available in Sri Lanka. And so what is the issue with absorbable suture in the anal canal? So these sutures are absorbable. These sutures are, these sutures, sutures are absorbable because the anal mucosa heals very easily. So it is just to, so I, I can't understand that question. Uh, sir, I think that question is about, uh, you asked uh, to make sure that there are no sutures that have gone inadvertently into the anal mucosa while doing a, a repair of a third degree tear. Yes, so that is, that is, to, that is in a situation where it's not a fourth degree tear. So that is not a, that like because in a fourth degree tear you have to do is use the sutures to close the anal epithelium, but if it's a if it's a third degree tear sometimes if it if you, when you when you suture uh, at the end of the end of the suture you do a do a rectal examination and then if you find a, a suture inadvertently gone through the rectal mucosa you just have to uh, open up again and make sure that the suture has not gone through the rectum. And then the, regarding the episiotomy, second degree tears, not the third and fourth, when patient had a primary repair and coming with perineal infection later, would you recommend early? I think we discussed that earlier, uh, recommended early secondary repair with antibiotics or manage antibiotics only like It depends on the how, how deep the suture is. Is it the midwife's job to teach perineal massage from 30 weeks? <laughs> I, I don't know how, how, how practical it is. Uh, I mean, here, of course, there, there are different kinds of midwives. Some of them, they, they, they do all sorts of things. But uh, they, 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 again, um, perineal massaging, the, the issue with this sort of thing is there is no standardization. So sometimes the, the physiotherapist tell them to massage the perineum, then it's going to be where you should massage and then how long you should massage. So um, uh, and there are some studies, there are one or two studies to show that perineal massaging helps in preventing third and fourth degree tears. But it is just uh, the, the standardization is not what's not been done. Uh, then if awaiting surgical correction for sphincter defect from previous delivery, await and deliver in the next pregnancy. Ah, that's a good question because um, this question is, if awaiting surgical correction for sphincter defect from previous delivery, can awa awaiting delivery in her next pregnancy, can have vaginal delivery and correct the defect? So I think what you're asking is, if there's a, if there's a defect, and then whether the patient has to wait until it's been repaired, well, it depends on the symptoms. So what we see is sometimes we see very small defects, which the patient doesn't have any symptoms. So from the repair point of view, there is because the, uh, the, um, the, the success of a secondary repair is very, very small. So most of the time it's only about 30% based on the colorectal studies. But our experience is because obstetricians, we do the um, identify these um, uh, defects in an early stage. So our rate success rate is quite good. We, I, I've done maybe about maybe 10 secondary repairs over the last maybe eight, 10 years. So I still follow them up. And they are reasonably, reasonably doing reasonably well. But if for, for any reason, if you are doing, if you have already done a secondary repair, then it has to be a C-section. Then again, even if there is a defect, if you look at the, the algorithm for the subsequent deliveries, if they are symptomatic or if they have a defect, we wouldn't recommend another vaginal birth because occult symptoms, sometimes all the, they, are, they are not symptomatic, although they have a defect, but if you go through another vaginal birth, then they can be symptomatic again. Right, so the, the next one is, what are the indications for colostomy following perineal tears? If you ask this from a colorectal surgeon, they will say each fourth degree tear, you should do a colostomy. 
but i think um it is mainly um from 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 the obstetrician point of view if we i mean we all are very experienced in repairing fourth degree tears so if you identify you do, do a fourth degree tear then you don't need a colostomy but the colostomy is indicated only in, a, in the case like i mentioned i showed you the pictures where there is a cloacal defect and then if you are doing a secondary sphincter repair because the secondary sphincter repair then you need to defunction. You need to defunction that. So because your second repair, uh, will, then if you the bowels open after that, it can get infected and it's going to be um, uh, it won't break down. So that's the time uh, we would normally recommend the uh, colostomy or the stoma. Are there any online training courses available? Uh, that of course, I think this sort of thing. Um, it's a bit difficult to say, um, I mean, online courses, this kind of uh, like a perineal repair is a, is a hands-on thing. So it's, um, it's very difficult. So maybe in the future, uh, we, we could arrange something um, similar to what we have done before. Um, yeah, so I think this, this time is a bit too tight in terms of the timing, but but I'm more than happy we will we'll, um, I'll have I'll discuss with Shamoon and then maybe whenever I come to Sri Lanka we can arrange some some workshops. Uh, in Sri Lanka, ministry supply either two or with twenty millimeters in the. Is it uh, two or is it Ycril or Aranda Fernando? I can't understand the question. I'm afraid. And the other thing is all i mean let's be realistic because we can always say what we practice here uh are uh, uh, something which we suggest but uh, th these are not always available in in all over the world and even here sometimes you, you won't you won't get the ideal uh switch matter sometimes they say of stock and everything so i think the important thing with regards to the suture materials I don't think uh, we use cat gut anymore in Sri Lanka, isn't it? It, it will be easy. It, it's, so that is, that, is the, that is the important thing. Most of the, uh, either it's, it's, it's polydioxinone or, or uh, polygla poly, polyglactin, polyglactin sutures, it's the, the Y-Kril. So the Y-Kril sutures, um, whatever the name, uh, it doesn't matter. And then even the size, unless, well, if it's a very big needle, um, try to avoid being the anal mucosa, right? So even if you don't have the PDS, uh, because actually if you look at the randomized studies, there's not much of a difference between using a PDS and the uh, uh, Y-Kril for the anal sphincter. So you don't, you don't have to have PDS for the anal sphincter. You can use the Y-Kril to suture the sphincter. But the important thing is identify the entire length of the anal sphincter. That's the important thing. Yeah. Uh, what are the indications for endoanal ultrasound or manometry in asymptomatic patients? Which is preferred? Well, the, now here, of course, it depends on the facility because we, 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 have, we have set this up, the, this clinic with the endoanal scan and the manometry. So we use for all the patients. If you have limited facilities, use it on the patients who are symptomatic use it on the patients who are symptomatic, then um, um, I don't know how freely available because most of the time, even here, some hospitals you have to uh, share these or you have to get the colorectal surgeons uh, or the radiologist to do the endoanal scans and the manometry. So that depends on how, what the facilities are available. But if they are symptomatic, and I think that is a definite, that's a good indication. So uh, that's the question. Can we use proline as a suture material? So um, again, the proline also monofilament. Proline also mono monofilament, something similar to the PDS. Uh, so I think um, if you are if you are if you are asking about using the proline for the external and internal sphincter, yes, but you need to use it a very fine one. You need to use a very fine one. And then could you please show us a video clip of the repair? Um, right, I think, uh, I don't think the time is permitted, but maybe, okay.
What are the appropriate suture materials for episiotomy, re-repairing? Is it absorbable or non-absorbable? We always use the absorbable, uh, but not the vicryl rapid, because vicryl rapid is normally dissolved within about seven to 10 days. So uh, if you are using a re-repair of the resuturing of the episiotomy, use the, the, the standard vicryl, which, which will stay longer, maybe 28 days or longer. What is the place of episiotomy for QB delivery in preventing anus sphincter injuries? I think the, 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 the studies have shown any kind of epi, uh, instrumental delivery. Uh, episiotomy is help to pre, helpful to prevent anal sphincter injuries. But again, if it's if it's a if it's a multi, and then so the, this is why you can't generalize. You you have to be um, in that particular moment, depending on the circumstances, depending on the 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 head. The, if the baby is very big, or if the baby has been pushing and everything. But if it's a multi small baby doing uh, one twos um, with perineal support, you can get away without episiotomy. So out of interlocking and end-to-end, -end, which sphincter repair technique is superior? So for the external sphincter, it's uh, it's not interlocking, it's overlap. Uh, yeah. So overlap and end-to-end, -end, the studies have shown both techniques are uh, give the same outcome. But personally, I use the overlap. If you train, if you can do it, do overlap because it gives you a good chunk of If possible, um, it, I think from for us, we, we, we repair it from the vaginal side. We repair it from the vaginal side because uh, if it's a colorectal, um, yeah, so we repair it from the vaginal side. So do we have figures for ultrasonic detection rate, swing to injuries among asymptomatic? Yes. So, the, do we have figures for ultrasonically detected rates of sphincter injuries among asymptomatic women? Yes. So this was the this was the seminal paper by my boss, uh, former boss, Mr. Abdul Sultan, many years ago. So he did the, he did scans on uh, uh, asymptomatic women after the, the the after after vaginal birth. They found thirty percent. They found 30% sphincter defects. But now we think that the most of them are missed tears rather than actual tears which were which were sutured. So if if you if there um, if so there there can be uh, so if you do the so even in the clinic we see the patients are completely asymptomatic. There are there are some patients with a smaller defects. If there are smaller defects, we don't need to do anything. Because if there are big defects, with this, because one thing is smaller defects are very difficult to repair. Sometimes trying to repair, uh, repair make it worse. What is the incidence of fistula following fourth degree tear? I would say very rare, unless you miss it. Unless you miss it. So if you, if you detect it and if you repair it, the, 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 the rate is less than, less than 1%, I would say, if you re repair it properly. Yeah, but then the fistula following fistula following fourth degree tear is is common. I mean, overall the fistula rate is very 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 small here. But I'm I'm sure because uh, it, I think even in the Sri, even in Sri Lanka, I think um, I, I don't know whether this is practical or whether it is already practicing. The midwives are they are they allowed to do a, a rectal examination when they do uh, so because I think in Sri Lanka most of the or, or almost all the episiotomies are sutured by the doctors I suppose isn't it yes yeah so I think so then uh, the responsibility is yours because they the midwives will deliver and then if you if you the the only other thing is if there is no tears. Then the I don't know whether this is practical whether the midwives can do a rectal examination to exclude a tear because they, those patients 
doctors won't see, isn't it? The, the midwife will deliver and then there are no tears, they will go home. Is that correct? Most often, I think uh, most people would do a vaginal exam. Doctors would do a vaginal examination before they go home. They go home. Yeah. Do that, uh, have that practice where the house officer would do an exam before. Exam, them. yes. Yeah. Say, same as when we were house officers. So nothing has changed, isn't it? So I think the important thing is, um, uh, I don't know, this is, this is something uh, actually even when we, when we suggested that even patients after the, after the first or second degree test, when we suggested through the through the college that you should do a rectal examination, there has been a lot of opposition from the from the midwives and you know uh, patient groups to say why do you want to do a rectal examination with a patient who doesn't have. But now everybody accepts that it is a must. Yeah, it is a must. So, uh, but at least when you do the vaginal examination, then you then you will be able to see, you will be able to feel if there is a, if there is a defect. So if there's any doubt, then you need to do a rectal examination. Uh, then would you advise cesarean section for all after anterior and posterior colporophy? Good question. Yes, because uh, that, that's, that's our general principle. If, if someone has had a continence procedure, or if someone had a prolapse repair, subsequent delivery has to be a cesarean section. It is because the vaginal birth will undo all the, all the work and then it's very difficult because you, it's, it's already been operated, then the, the vaginal birth will disrupt everything. Yeah. So, um, in buttonhole injury, only rectal mucosa affected. No, the isolated buttonhole injury is only the rectal mucosa, mucosa is affected, but there can be a separate, you know, lateral vaginal wall, but the important thing, the sphincter is intact. Yeah. Yeah. So shard, Sinirvadhan, uh, overlap technique, less frequent, flatus incontinence. Yes. So that's, that's based on my study, my sort of randomized control trial, but the subsequent studies did not show uh, uh, the significant improvement. So that's why when we do the uh, systematic review, it didn't come up as a, as a uh, improvement in the symptoms. Based on 30% figure, uh, what 30% of figure? Is it still reasonable to counsel at the rate of two to 5% and decline request for cesarean section? I can't understand that question, but overall, generally, if you look at the litigation point of view, there has been hardly any cases where there has been a litigation because you did a cesarean section unnecessarily, right? So very, very well, almost unheard of, unless you end up with having a you know massive complication. But uh, most of the time, the litigation is not doing a cesarean section in time. So that's where the difficulties. Sometimes we we get the patient absolutely fine, so no symptoms, scan is normal, pressures are normal. And then, so we explain to them, so this one, so you, you can have a vaginal birth and then, uh, then they will, uh, they, they say, uh, no, I would like to have a C-section. And then, um, I mean, now, now I mean, with, with this, uh, the, the, the recent uh, Montgomery uh, sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the decision, uh, the, the, the patients have the choice. So if they ask for a C-section, then of course you need to explain to them the risks, the risk of PPH, risk of uh, organ damage and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, so you have to, as far as you uh, explain to them and document, then they can have a C-section. And sometimes I, I, I think it's, it's reasonable because sometimes it's just not the tear is fine, but it's just the 
but it's just the the trauma of having the episiotomy sorry having the the, the sutures having the pain and um, everything okay I think I have answered most of your questions. Yes, I think uh, button hole. Yeah, I think we've answered. All Sorry, right. Mark. Yeah, go ahead. I think we've uh, managed to complete all the forty-one questions. Yeah. Am I missing? Uh, from, yeah, same thing. Right, uh, uh, Professor Dodampahala, are you around? But I think uh, uh, now that we've taken all the questions, uh, maybe we, uh, we, we can sort of conclude today's session. So um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Juan Fernando, um, for your very, very interesting and informative talk today. And uh, it is my pleasure on behalf of the Sri Lankan College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists um, um, uh, to thank you uh, for accepting our invite and for dedicating your valuable time in delivering today's talk. So we had about uh, 95 uh, attendees today listening in um, and I'm confident that uh, your uh, talk uh, helped to improve the knowledge as well as uh, the understanding of um, uh, perineal injury following childbirth. We actually took quite a lot of questions. We had about 42 questions, uh, which uh, Dr. Juan Fernando answered. And uh, if any one of you have any more questions, uh, he will be coming for our college sessions. Uh, he's doing a um, pre-Congress workshop on Eurodynamics and also on uh, uh, following the inauguration on the second day of the sessions, he's also uh, running a symposium related to Eurogyne. So if you have any more questions, uh, you can keep it for him. Uh, when he comes, you can catch him and get him to answer it for you. Uh, and uh, thank you once again, Dr. Juan Fernando, for your time. Thank you. And thank you to all the participants for making it a success. Yeah, thank you, Shamon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you.